With mom jeans back in style and Tracy Chapman's fast car topping the charts, it seems like America can't get over the 80s and 90s. And neither can the hosts of the podcast In Retrospect, who look back on all the pop culture trends, scandals, and questionable fashion choices that define the era. One of them, Susie Banacarum, joins me now. Susie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So I love this podcast. It's so much fun. But I also think there's a couple of threads here that I think are so important. It's really important, vital reporting. I mean, you have a long history in news and journalism, and you bring all of that into this. And I guess I just wanted to ask you, you know, you talk at one point about this pop, pop culture being seen as low culture or gossipy or sort of like trivia, yeah. you know, and, and the way that you're looking at it and addressing it, I think you raise a lot of really important issues of kind of analyzing the past. What do you make of that? I mean, why did you decide to do this podcast about low culture? Um, well, you know, I think my career has been very focused on hard news. So for me, this is getting an opportunity to look at issues that I've always really cared about and love. I mean, I grew up on pop culture. I'm Iranian. I was born in Iran and came to this country when I was three. So I think like a lot of immigrants, I learned what it meant to be an American from pop culture. You know, this is how I learned about the country that I came to be part of. So for me, you know, I think we often dismiss pop culture because it's seen as for girls or it's seen as, you know, silly or lowbrow, but it is the way we tell our stories to each other. And the stories we choose to tell and the way we choose those stories, they tell us a lot about the time we're in and also about what we care about, you know? So that's why we wanted to explore these issues. And so many of these episodes are, are just about iconic images or themes or things that like I grew this is you're talking to to my generation as well growing up and just taking these things you know at face value right like Pamela Anderson's red swimsuit or Monica Lewinsky or Anita Hill or you know you talked about 1992 is the year of the woman while all of these horrible scandals were going on that were extremely sexist um, I want to play this clip from the podcast where you talk about you're talking about Britney Spears memoir and I thought so much about this lens as well, where, you know, during her period where she shaved her head, everyone was making a big joke out of it. And now years and years later, you know, we see this, her struggle really, right? Like through her own words, or at least the words of her and her ghostwriter. But let's, see, let's hear this clip um, just about you. You're kind of analyzing the media coverage of her at the time. If there's one thing in the book that becomes very clear, it's really how afraid of them she was, how aggressive they were with her how much of her life was controlled by their presence and how much she had to evade them. And I thought that was interesting because it's kind of changed so much. Like now yeah. there are more safeguards in place, especially with children, but she was before right. any of that occurred. So they were building the narrative that we were absorbing at the time. And I think yeah. we were really young. So that for a lot of us was just, we were like, okay, this is what it is. You know, this is the tabloids are telling us what it is and this is how it is. Yeah, I mean, I think what happens is, especially with women in media, is that they sort of become characters. And it's very easy to forget that these are people, right? Because we start to consume them as media, as stories. And even as journalists, I think this is something that we have to really be vigilant about in ourselves. And Brittany is a very clear example of that. For many years, she just became sort of this character, and she was talked about in these really sort of egregious ways, right? She was clearly having a mental health struggle, but instead it was, she's out of control, she's partying, she's drunk. And then when she does this thing, which is she shaves her head, it's really in response to the fact that she's being hounded by the paparazzi. She's desperate to get away from them. And there's this moment where they're hounding her and she goes into this like diner and she's trying to like find just a moment to herself and finally she can't and she does this really dramatic thing. And the assumption is that, you know, she is suddenly doing this crazy thing because she's on drugs or whatever the sort of narrative is. But in some ways the media is creating the narrative it themselves because they are hounding her to the degree that she cannot find a way to function in this world. She's with her children often when they are hounding her. So I really developed such an empathy for her that I didn't have 
you know, at the time, because at the time I consumed it like everyone else consumed it, right? Sort of the way that people are consuming this Kate Middleton mm. story. Now, yes. Right? <laughs> but I like, wanted to, I wanted, yeah, because yeah, Princess died. Like fun gossip, but mm-hmm. this is like a, a person, right? This is a person lie. And I'm not saying that I don't indulge in that sometimes, but it is important when it's happening to sort of ask yourself, what would this be like if this was a man? Like if a man needed to take a couple months off for a surgery, would the reaction to it be the same? Would they be treated with the same sort of intrigue and this idea that they're like being hounded? And then this thing where she had to put out the statement saying that she does Photoshopping in her spare time. I mean, it just seems there is like a real gendered quality to the way people are obsessing about her. And we see that over and over again in these stories in the podcast. It is interesting now, though, because, you know, what's been said is that the British media actually has been like, yes, she's getting hounded. And of course, we all have conspiracy theories about it. But the British media has been better about it, I think, now than they were about Princess Di. Right. And so I would love to hear your thoughts about just the comparison of then versus now. I do think they've gotten better about it. In general, I think there has been more backlash to paparazzi. So there is an improvement to some degree. And the laws in England are really different. So they do have to be a little bit more careful around the royals. Like, I think a lot more speculation is happening in the U.S. media than is happening in the British press because they have a little bit more um, guardrails around the kind of rampant speculation that we do here um, that our First Amendment laws really allow. So I think... You know, there is some improvement, but what happens is, is that even with those improvements, there are these moments in culture where people still get their narrative flattened in ways that we don't always realize we're doing, right? I mean, Meghan Markle is another example of this. I think in a lot of ways, people see Meghan Markle as a character and they have a hard time seeing her as a person who was actually trying to navigate this very complicated family. And so... When they talk about her, they talk about her sort of as this, like, character as opposed to a a person who is flawed, you know, who is going to make mistakes, but we all make mistakes, right? I mean, that's sort of what we're looking at in the podcast. It's not just to look at what happened to these other women, but to sort of ask ourselves why they resonate with us. Like, for me, I feel a lot of empathy for a lot of these women because I've made a ton of mistakes myself. And they weren't in the glare of a national spotlight. Imagine being Britney's age and having that kind of attention on you. It would be, you know, really overwhelming. And I'm glad I got to make all my mistakes in the shadow of darkness. <laughs> and you mentioned, like, you mentioned growing up and absorbing culture and not always having cable. You didn't have cable, so you're watching a lot of, like, the WB and CW and yeah. really just this, like, gutter television that I also love. Yeah. Um, and I think and I still love, by the way, I mean, yeah. I'm not above like a real housewives marathon. I love all those things because, you know, I have a theory about the real housewives, which everyone dismisses as just like trash, but it's really a woman's workplace drama. How many other shows do they gather five very strong opinionated women and then just give them the hour to do whatever they want? Like we just don't have that many spaces for women like that. So it's not all just trash. There are trashy elements to it. I'm not going to deny that. But there are things to learn about the world from these shows and these things that we consume. I can't wait for the Real Housewives episode and for the Royal Family Update episode (laughs) comparison. Susie Vanna Karam, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.